Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love every Saturday at 12 15 p.m. And we are going to deal with how God deals with our enemies, how God deals with trouble, chaos, disturbances in our lives, how everything falls right into the hands of God as he executes his plans in our lives. And you're going to see how God does this through his word. So I want you to go with me to Nahum, N-A-H-U-M. Nahum chapter one. Mm, mm, mm. And we're going to start at verse three. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way. I love this line right here. Let me say this slowly. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languishes in Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good and and a, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Mm, mm, mm. But this is what he does to the enemy. Verse 8. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Now, we're going back to my favorite line where he says, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind, in the storm, and in the clouds or the dust of his feet. That's verse three. You know, we oftentimes get caught up in what's going on around us. We get caught up in the news. We get caught up in in the the uh, friction that's going on in some of the relationships that we encounter through our lives, whether they are happening within the church or on the professional level uh, around our residence or in the spirit realm. Either way, we're going to run into opposition. That's just a given for life. We're going to run into opposition in the natural we're going to run into opposition in the spirit realm. And the thing we have to remember is who is in charge of this whole thing? Remember that. Who is in charge? It's not the devil. It's not a demon. Do you realize that? Huh. Let me share something with you. Now, some of you have heard this story before. But this is just so you know how much authority is in the name of Jesus. And we're just tapping the tip of the iceberg. This is nothing compared to how deep his name gets. And the reason I think that is, is because some of us won't even go that far. If Jesus said, I want you to walk with me through a dungeon that's filled with demonic spirits. Some of them will look like giant monsters. Some of them will growl at you and, and, and salivate, waiting to dig their paws and their teeth into you. But you're with me. They can't touch you. Would you be willing to go with him? Nine times out of ten, I'll answer that. A lot of us would not. Because we don't really, really believe to the point of being convinced that the power of Jesus overrides, supersedes, hands down, just minimizes the little bit of power that Satan and the, and the demonic forces have. 
Yes, they are strong. Yes, they are powerful. But look who's on your side, Jesus. There's no comparison. That's like comparing a candle to a brush fire. Which do you think is gonna do the most damage? The candle or the brush fire? Consider Jesus the brush fire, y'all. And I don't care how powerful a demon is, consider a demon a candle or a match, a little match. Now, before I go further into this message, I bind any and all forms of retaliation in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, Satan, and you will not attack anybody in this group or anybody that hears my video in Jesus' name. I bind you. I cast you out. I cancel your assignment against us. And we plead the blood of Jesus all over you, rendering you paralyzed and useless powerless. No weapon formed against us will prosper. And I cancel every weapon that's been formed against us permanently in the name of Jesus. Now, back to the message. All right. What I want you to understand is there are going to be times in our lives where it seems like the whirlwind is breaking loose. Another word for a whirlwind for some of you who live in the middle, in the Midwest is tornado. That's another word for whirlwind. Maybe hurricane winds. Listen, I saw a wind, I saw one time where the wind was blowing so strong in Altadena. I was driving down the street and I, I was fighting to keep the car in the lane. As I watched a garbage can, and I'm not talking plastic, a metal garbage can flying out of one yard, two yards down to someone else's front yard. I knew that wind was strong. And I said, that's not even a hurricane. That is not what you call a tornado. That doesn't even come close. Imagine the strength of a tornado that can pick up a big rig that's loaded with gasoline or any kind of fuel. You know those things are heavy. You know they're heavy. Try pushing one. Ha <laughs> ha. You can push a car, maybe, but you sure can't push a big rig. It'll look at you and laugh. Well, guess what? That's the kind of power God's wind has. He will have his way in the whirlwind. So when the winds of adversity come into your life, when things come against you, when situations rise and rear their ugly heads and threaten you, threaten your well-being, God is in the midst of it all. God is the one in control, not the devil. I don't care what he tries to do to attack you. God is the one in control. When you read the book of, of Job, you notice that when God and Job, I mean, God and the devil discussed Job, that God put the limits on what the devil could do. You notice that? Yeah. Well, let's read it. I want you to see how much authority God has over the devil. I want you to hear this with your own ears. Job 1.9. Let's go real quick. I hadn't planned on this, but let's just go. All right. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught or for nothing? Okay. 10. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house? and about all that he has and on every side. In other words, you know, you got this big old thick hedge of protection around him. Uh, the, the, um, the essence of the attitude of what he's saying is, of course he's going to love you. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he had and he will curse thee to thy face. That's the devil talking. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath 
is in thy power. That means God just put it in his power just then. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. Who's calling the shots, y'all? God, not Satan. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger. And this when all the bad news started happening. This happened. That happened, Job. Oh, no. Right? Now, let's go further down because I want you to hear God's authority in this. Okay, here we go. This is chapter two. He says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man. Wow, this is crazy. So verse four, I'm not going to read all that. Verse four for the sake of time. And Satan answered the Lord. I want you to hear what Satan is saying and what, what God says in response. And said, skin for skin, yet all that a man hath will he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. He's wagering God. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, he is in thine hand. But check this out. He puts, he gives Satan the authority to do this harm, but check out what he says. But save his life. In other words, he wasn't telling Satan to save his life. He was saying, Everything is in your hand, but except for his life. That's the terminology of the King James. And save means except, except for. So uh, so I want you to hear this. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Now, of course, God healed him at the end. Because God's the one in control. I don't care what the doctor tells you. I don't care what the diagnosis is. And I'm not saying I don't care. I'm saying in comparison to God being in control, it's neither here nor there. Because no matter what Satan threw at Job, no matter what he did, he took his kids, he took his family, he took his cattle, he took his servants, he took his workmen. He just cleared that house and that property and nothing left but Job. His, his wife even said, why don't you just curse God and die? Listen, <laughs> when God is handling your life, and you are committed to him. And stuff starts going topsy-turvy. There's that whirlwind. Remember who controls the wind. Remember who tells the wind which way to go. North, east, south, or west. Who tells the wind to blow. And who tells the wind when to stop blowing. How hard to blow and how mildly to send a soft breeze. God knows he's in control. He's the one that's pulling the leash on Satan. Satan might cast a big shadow. His demons might cast a big shadow and throw some serious threats. But Satan cannot do a thing unless God gives him permission. And if God gives him permission, God is doing something in your life. God is, not Satan. And God's got the outcome sitting right in his hand. He knows the plans he has for you. Plans to bless you and not harm you. You hear me? Remember that. Don't get intimidated by life. Don't get intimidated by sickness. Don't get intimidated by financial woes. Don't get intimidated by opposition. Don't get intimidated by threats and don't get intimidated by demonic forces. Your spiritual foot even if you have a size five shoe, is 
bigger than the biggest demon out there. Why? Only if you serve Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, and you believe, trust, and use the name of Jesus, guess what? You are on the upper hand because you have the power, you have the authority over all because of who's on your side and whose side you're on. When you wield the name of Jesus like a weapon, it cuts, baby. When I was walking down Mountain View, and it was nighttime, you guys have heard this, so so I'll say it real quick so I don't I don't bore you with the same story. But a lot of people haven't heard this, and they need to understand the name of Jesus works just as strongly in the natural as it does in the supernatural. Here I am. Now, my past experience, let me give you a little background. When I was unsaved and I cussed like a sailor and kicked like a mule, I have been attacked twice in my life, walking down Mountain View during mating season, and the dogs came out from all sides, attacked, bit, scratched, nip, and all the cussing and the big pocketbook swinging I could do did not get them dogs off of me. I had to run to get off the block to get away from those dogs. Check it out. Saved in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost, knowing the name of Jesus has power, knowing that the name was the only weapon I had on me. I didn't have a big purse. I don't cuss anymore. So what am I going to do? I don't have a gun. I don't have a big foot that can do any harm. What am I going to do? Now, I know what my experience is, but now... The difference is, I have the name of Jesus. I didn't back then, but I do now. So here I am on the block, and all these dogs, mating season, they're charging me like, I mean, like with a vengeance. And I'm looking at them coming at me from all sides, in front, side, behind, everywhere. And I hollered, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Boop! All of a sudden, it was like something came over them, and they completely forgot where they were going. Not only did they look lost, but they looked like they had no more awareness that I was even in their midst. And I was able to walk, not run, to the bus stop. And not one of those dogs came anywhere near me. The power of the name of Jesus. Now, if the name of Jesus has that kind of power, how much power do you think God has? Think about that. You don't have to be threatened. It, it, when I was in the hospital in ICU, oh, I was attacked by demons left and right. All they did was annoy me. They just made me mad. I thank God for taking me through spiritual warfare because I had to get past the fear part. We all have to go through those stages when he's training us. That's called boot camp. He's training you to do spiritual warfare. He's teaching you how to deal with, with different types of demons. Some demons you will find that rebuking them in the name of Jesus gets the job done. Other demons, you bind them and that stops them dead in their tracks. Some demons, you have to tell them never return again. You have to quote the word at some of these demons. But then there are some stubborn, brazen demons. You got to praise God in their face. And that's the only way you're going to get rid of them. So what I'm trying to tell you is, whatever weapon you choose to, to use, use it. Don't run. Don't panic. Use the weapons you have. Because knowing from experience that a pit bull could not touch me when I bound him in the name of Jesus. He was frozen on his behind until his owner called him in the house. But he didn't come out to play. He charged me like he was ready, like he heard the dinner bell. 
So what I'm trying to explain to you, I, uh, uh, one of my friends, they were in the middle of a multi-car accident on the freeway at top speed. And all they had time to get out of their mouth was, Jesus, help! And what happened? The cars were flying. Cars were banging and kicking and bumping and, 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 and flipping. I mean, they were just going crazy. There's the whirlwind. <laughs> and guess what happened? It was like, they said it was like watching the parting of the waters. When one would come at them, another car would bump them out the way. Another one would come flying, another thing would catch it and knock it off to the side. And as, as they went forward, the parting of the waters, all the crashing cars moved out of their way. And they were able to tootle on down the road, unscratched, unscathed, undented, completely, completely harm free. So they knew that it was the name of Jesus that protected them going through that accident. How often do you use the name of Jesus? This is real life now. We ain't talking demons. We're talking real life, awake, on the road. How often do you use his name? How many ways do you use his name? Do you depend on him or you depend on your own devices? your own skills, your own wisdom, cunning, and, 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 and I mean, what do you depend on really? Huh? When you feel that pain in your chest, in your upper left arm, do you call 911 or is the first thing out of your mouth, I rebuke heart attack in the name of Jesus. When you feel your left side or your right side going numb and the room is spinning and you feel yourself going out, do you say somebody call 911 or do you say, Lord, I bind stroke in the name of Jesus. I rebuke high blood pressure in the name of Jesus. I command my blood pressure to go down now in the name of Jesus. I have avoided heart attacks. I have avoided strokes. Well, stroke one time. Hopefully never again. I, hopefully I never have to deal with that again. But the bottom line is, I dealt with the attacks, the, the AFib. I dealt with a lot of that stuff through the name of Jesus. Now, the one time that I felt like the Lord was giving me the wisdom to know this is bigger than that. This is more complicated. I want you to see what's going on. That's when I called the paramedic. And that was two years, I mean, two months out of my life, in and out of the hospital, as God let me know, this is a crisis I'm getting you through because I need you to make adjustments in your lifestyle, where your diet is concerned, where the amount of fluids you intake is concerned. So God will show you, he will show you what to do. He will give you warning dreams. He will lead. He will guide you. He will give you suggestions. He will tell you when to run. He'll tell you when to stop. He'll even tell you when to stay home and don't go out of your house. He will tell you. And if you obey him, that's your protection. It's not always in, I got the authority so I could go do what I want to do. That's presumptuous sin, believe it or not. The Lord taught me that one night in a dream where someone knocked on the door. And in the dream, God's voice spoke to me and said, do not open the door. Well, in the dream, I didn't recognize it was God. So I said, oh, don't be so scared. It, 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 you know, what harm can they do? And I went to open the door in my mind by faith, y'all. I was opening that door by faith right? And when I opened the door, guess what happened? That demon locked his hands on me and I could not break loose. And that's when I said, get off of me, get off. And it didn't work. I'm shaking, trying to get loose. Didn't work until I said that name. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Let me go. Poof, disappeared, gone, I'm free. And now I'm awake. I said, Lord, lesson learned. My protection was not in my authority over the demon. My protection was in the obeying your voice. Had I not opened the door, that 
that, what is the word I'm looking for? That struggle would not have ensued in the first place. Think about that. Some of you, you make presumptuous decisions thinking, I got Jesus. And sometimes Jesus, sometimes God is telling you, you need to have my word and you need to obey my word. If I tell you no, don't you go. Because if you go, you're out from under the ark of safety because I told you no, but you decided to go. And all the faith in the world ain't going to protect you. Simple obedience would have been your protection. Here's another case in point, and I'm going to close right here. He has his way in the whirlwind. I'm leaving my house. And I felt all day long, I've been in and out, running here, running there. And I was going to get my car insured the very next day. We had just bought the car. And we had to you know, make sure the money was in the bank in order to get it insured. So we said, okay, what's one more day? No big deal. Guess what? <laughs> I'm getting ready to leave. That feeling is on me again. An accident, an assignment of an accident is against me. I feel it. I feel it like never, ever in my life. I'm feeling it all day long. And it hits me strong when I'm hitting the door. So I sit in my car. And the person that's in the car with me, I was giving them a ride home because they were doing work in our house. And I said, come on, let's pray. And I took authority. I bound. I rebuke. I canceled the assignment of the enemy against me. I commanded the devil to let go of me and the road and the car and everything else. And no weapon for I was quoting the word. I was doing it all, y'all. But guess what? Simple obedience would have been my protection. But something ensued that wasn't necessary. God still had his way because I didn't get hurt. So the prayers were answered in that God protected me and my passenger. But guess what, y'all? My car got totaled. Lesson learned. Presumptuous sin. If God says don't go, if you're feeling that ominous feeling, you better sit, stay put. Guess what? You better stay put. Don't get out there thinking that you can wield every weapon you want because God may be telling you the only weapon you got today, buddy, is obedience. Think about that. So I had to do without having a car for three whole years. Somebody ran the stop sign and hit me broadside. I mean, the window, everything was busted and the door hit me in my left side, but I was not hurt not a scratch, and neither was my passenger. Lesson learned, but I no longer had a car. So my point to you, and listen, five years later, I was telling that story. I said, that's the only thing I never could understand. How could God allow that to happen? I took authority. I prayed. I did this. I did that. And the Lord spoke to me right there. It was the first time he finally dealt with it. He said, I did all I could to stop you from leaving your house. Remember when you almost hit that bicycle rider? Remember when you almost went off the curb? Remember when that car almost hit you? And you kept feeling that there was an assignment. You said it out your mouth. You knew it. I told you. You heard it. You felt it. But you kept going anyway. Sometimes your best protection is obedience. I cried my eyes out. I said, Lord, that was my fault. I'm sorry. And that was my lesson on presumptuous sin. Yes, God will have his way in the whirlwind, but look at all the headaches you can avoid if you just obey. Just obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And some of us, we trust, but we don't obey. Yes, we trust, but we don't obey. So we're unhappy in Jesus, cause we trust, but don't obey. <laughs> okay, I'm done, y'all. <laughs> anyway, I hope you get it. I hope it makes sense to you. Mm, anyway, 
So cover everything in prayer, be obedient, get in his word, know the authority you have and recognize the God you really serve. He's always in control. But don't allow the devil to have more control than he needs to through your disobedience. Okay? Okay. I'm done. Amen. Amen. <laughs>